The show Fleabag is widely enjoyed and critically acclaimed, for its many fantastic aspects, its biggest strength likely being its witty, blunt humour. But many are also drawn in by how it confronts feminism. I sometimes worry that I wouldn't be such a feminist if I had bigger tits. Fleabag isn't a feminist show in the sense that it has any sort of message or agenda it wants to spread. Rather, much of it feels inherently feminist because of its hard-hitting and real portrayal of life as a woman. He's one of those men who is explosively sexually inappropriate with everyone, but makes you feel bad if you take offense because he was just being fun. Fleabag is in fact often cited as an example of the female gaze. And it's true, little could feel more like the female gaze than having a female main character who constantly tells us, the audience, what she's thinking. The next man who walks in here is getting ridden to death. The relationships and emotions explored are that of female characters, and most men are side characters with names like bus rodent or hot misogynist. It portrays the many aspects of what it's like to be a modern day woman, from the small stuff- I think my period's coming. To bigger societal problems. <laughs> walk of shame. But no one champions Fleabag as a representation of perfect feminism. Fleabag herself says, We are bad feminists. Her story unflinchingly shows us the difficulties of womanhood, feminism, and in some situations, even portrays a concerningly nihilistic viewpoint. But when we look deeper into the show, we can see that there's a lot of less cynical and very important takeaways about feminism. Fleabag is the story of a dry-witted, unnamed protagonist, referred to only as Fleabag, navigating life in London while running a cafe, searching for love, and dealing with tragedy. I just want to cry all the time. She's very flawed, and perhaps even an anti-heroine, but most viewers find her remarks about the world around her painfully relatable nonetheless. If you could change anything in the whole world, what would it be? My thighs. You? I've always been insecure about my face. If you haven't seen the show, there won't be many spoilers in this video, save for a season 2 spoiler in the final chapter of this video. As a female character, Fleabag is perhaps one of the most nuanced out there. She's not a helpless stereotype, nor is she a perfect, strong female character free of flaws. I have a horrible feeling that I'm a greedy, perverted, selfish, apathetic, cynical, depraved, morally bankrupt woman who can't even call herself a feminist. She speaks to the audience, often to avoid vulnerability, and that technique, refusing to engage fully, means that she can avoid pain, but also moments of happiness. I think you know how to love better than any of us. That's why you find it all so painful. And though she has her issues, some of Fleabag's unlikability is derived from the expectations placed on women to be perfect and ladylike, meaning that her comfortableness with discussing things like female sexuality can make viewers uncomfortable. I'm not obsessed with sex. I just can't stop thinking about it. As Hannah Houlihan in Collider writes, she's sexually and emotionally honest without feeling the need to apologize for it, a rare thing to see in female-led stories. What tends to make her unlikable isn't merely unlikable traits, it's generally traits that are more socially acceptable for men, such as sexuality or vulgarity. Fuck me up the ass. Fleabag's relationship with feminism is complicated to say the least. One of the most realistic parts of the show is her difficulty and confusion with feminism, which many women can relate to. But with Fleabag, her relationship with feminism is so complex because she's vulnerable with it. She doesn't understand the rules of it. As someone who's naturally quite cynical, It's not going to make me an optimist, you will ruin my life. Fleabag's response to her confusion at feminism is generally cynicism. Though she critiques and often mocks men's actions when breaking the fourth wall, in her actual interactions with men, she often masquerades as far more stereotypically feminine and docile. That's quite rare, yeah. <laughs> I hate myself. <laughs> she also clashes with the representations of more standard, classy feminism in her life, her unnamed godmother and sister Claire. Women are subtle warriors, strong at heart. You know, we don't have to use muscular force to get what we want, we just use our tits. <laughs> innate femininity. While Fleabag's godmother tends to take a more surface-level, aesthetic approach to feminism, Claire also represents feminism in a form. She's a successful, high-achieving businesswoman whose tidy life contrasts with Fleabag's, though she too is impacted by sexism and the patriarchy. The only thing harder than having to tell your super high-powered, perfect, anorexic, rich super sister that you've run out of money is having to ask her to bail you out. Fleabag is plagued by the pain that comes with living as a woman and dealing with sexism. I know that my body as it is now really is the only thing I have left, and when that gets old and unfuckable, I may as well just kill it. And somehow there isn't anything worse than someone who doesn't want to fuck me. But her response to all this is generally just a tongue-in-cheek self-awareness that she uses to distance herself from it.
Fleabag isn't the only example of this type of character, though. There's been a surge in the popularity of these supposedly unlikable women who take a cynical, sarcastic approach to feminism, or at least prompt us to do so. One of the reasons for this might be a backlash to the cringy girl-boss feminism that many don't want to associate themselves with. As Emmeline Klein writes for BuzzFeed News, maybe it's a curdling of the hyper-optimistic hashtag girlboss, run the world, girls, feminism of the aughts. We now seem to be interiorizing our existential aches and angst, smirking knowingly at them and numbing ourselves to maintain our nonchalance. Faced with a rather daunting problem, sexism, many have slipped into what Klein calls dissociation feminism. So for many feminists who are as cynical as Fleabag, it can be easy to view women as almost inherently cursed. Women are born with pain built in. And then try and romanticize this pain, namely on social media, especially within a culture that has heavily romanticized mental illness. People have even coined the term Fleabag era as a way of trying to make these feelings into more of an aesthetic. Using intellectual detachment can be an effective strategy to dull pain, but romanticizing self-destruction rarely leads down a productive path. Fleabag is very representative of this mindset. She rarely engages in interactions, instead deadpanning to the camera. Why do you think your father suggested you come for counseling? Um, I think because my mother died and he can't talk about it. And my sister and I didn't speak for a year because she thinks I tried to sleep with her husband. And because I spent most of my adult life using sex to deflect from the screaming void inside my empty heart. I'm good at this. Only as she starts to develop as a character does she begin to remain in the moment. Much of the online discourse surrounding Fleabag romanticizes messy self-destruction, but that's not all Fleabag is. In season two, though Fleabag remains flawed, she begins to improve. She starts new initiatives at her cafe. Why are there so many people here? Well, it's just successful, I guess. She patches up issues with her sister, and she chats with a woman with distinct feminist views. Women's awards. Congratulations. Oh, it's infantilizing bollocks. Most importantly, she starts the most authentic relationship she's had throughout the entire show, with a priest. The priest is the first person to actually call her out for how she goes somewhere by breaking the fourth wall. He's a bit annoying, actually. What is that? What? <laughs> that thing that you're doing, it's like you disappear. Despite this, the ending of Fleabag doesn't feel too optimistic, but our takeaway as viewers shouldn't be to approach the world nihilistically. It should be a couple other things. First, feminism is messy. Being a feminist doesn't mean not being affected by the patriarchy or sexism. When in season one, a speaker says, Raise your hands. If you would trade five years of your life for the so-called perfect body. And Fleabag raises her hand, that doesn't make her less of a feminist. It just means she's impacted by beauty standards, just like everyone. She wants to identify as a feminist, but she feels like she's letting feminism down all the time. And second, Fleabag shows us that dissociative, nihilistic feminism just isn't the way to go. Except most people are... What? Shit. Listen. People are all we've got. The rise of these types of attitudes, climate nihilism for example, is representative of an exhaustion with fighting against broken systems. However, disengaging from feminism is often a decision intertwined with privilege. The women who are disengaging are generally white, straight, able-bodied women, where the systems of oppression otherwise benefit them. Many women don't even have the privilege of dissociating from feminism. When Fleabag confesses her love and the priest responds, It'll pass. Perhaps he's referring to this love. But the final shot, showing Fleabag walking away from the camera and giving us a wave, hints that perhaps, with a little work, our dissociative feminism will pass too. What was that? What? Where did, you, where did you just go? Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and as always, leave me a comment if you have any thoughts on this or video ideas for the future. See you next time!